without further ado, once he gets his microphone set up, uh, let's welcome An Andrew on the stage. Okay. You can hear me. Thank you, Larry. Um, can I ask a quick question? So you saw two products up on the screen there in terms of Kickstarter. How many people here are developing products? Hands up. Okay. And tech? Products or tech related? Okay. And then there's people that are doing other types of ventures. Give me an example or what are you doing at the moment? Anyone like to talk? No? Sorry? Mobile payments. Mobile payments, okay. Well, I hope I'm going to be able to give you the basics of crowdfunding. Um, I first started noticing crowdfunding back in 2006, 2007. Um, I work as a professional fundraiser in the creative sector in Ireland. And we noticed the traction that Kickstarter and Indiegogo were getting at that point in time when they were relatively small ideas and seeing how they were growing, but being frustrated by the fact that you couldn't use them in Ireland. And we set out with an idea to create an Irish platform that could uh, help Irish people use crowdfunding as a means of generating finance. And what I'm going to do here is talk about characteristics of successful campaigns and then just some of the pitfalls that people regularly fall into. And one of the things I always start with is research. You, does that work? That one? Are you able to? Yeah. Um, so lots of people, when they come to fund it, they'll see that we're really uh, our strongest categories are performance-related projects, their film and television, their art projects, and primarily music. But we've had lots of technological projects on the site that have been successful, and some of them are raising amounts of money that are enough in terms of seed capital to get them going, and then move on to maybe a second campaign. So here's two examples, um, uh, Sheepwatch, which is a startup and a, uh, of a, from a group of children in school that have created uh, a tech solution for sheep in, uh, in fields when they get attacked, and basically it alerts a farmer of what's happening. They've attracted significant investment as a result of this crowdfunding campaign, and we were personally contacted by about five or six different investors who were keen to take that to a global uh, platform. Uh, Story Map uh, is another example of just a really great mix of all of the creativity in Ireland and then a technological app and website that captures stories from around Dublin and different cities. I think they're growing into different areas. But to start out with, if you ever have any questions about crowdfunding in an Irish context, our web links are there. We always put on our blog crowdfunding advice. Our FAQs are regularly updated. And there's a crowdfunding advice and case study section on that blog as well. But we are professional fundraisers. And when people come to us and they want to fundraise, we want them to be successful. We don't want them to go up on a site and fail. And one of the things that we have is a 75% success rate. So three out of every four projects that come on to fund it are now successful. And in the last year alone, the number of projects that have been raising between 15 and 30,000 has increased by many multiples. So while we still remain at a smaller level of capital, we are at a significant level of capital at the start phase of many projects. And something to bear in mind. And I'm not going to s switch between screens, but if I could, I'd be showing you to go onto Indiegogo and go onto Kickstarter and look at the successful projects from Ireland. It's really simple to do. If you go onto Indiegogo, you have a filter by Ireland, by city, you can see exactly how many projects have been funded and the highest levels that they've been funded. So on Indiegogo, when you select most funded, I think it's about $50,000. And on Kickstarter, projects from Ireland, and of one of them, which is one of the highest earning ones, is about $100,000. So when you see 8 million euros, or dollars and 10 million dollars, they are outliers. There are only a handful of them. And yes, they attract lots of attention, but being really realistic about how you can raise money online and think about the practicalities of actually managing 
potentially hundreds and hundreds of new consumers if you're a small startup. It's something that you have to practically think about. How are you going to manage a crowdfunding campaign? And the campaigns that have had those 8 million and 10 million are ones that regularly face issues around deliverability, getting their product to market, and actually having a team of people around them that are capable of delivering all of their rewards. So to give you an idea of Fundit, um, we started it three, just over three years ago. Um, this slide is from last week. Um, and we are well on our way to our 700th successful project. And we're just short of 3 million euro pledged to successful projects at this time. The average project varies hugely, but about 4,000 euro is where um, our average is lying. Um, and the average pledge on the site is about 55 euro. A duration or a fundraising campaign on our website typically lasts five weeks. So they're quite short, they're not long. Many people think the longer you go with the campaign, the more likely you are to raise more money. But in terms of just short, concise fundraising campaigns, if you focus on a period that's shorter, people come on, they see what they have to do, they click, they purchase and they buy and they know they can't delay it. The maximum project today we've had is 32,000 euro. That was a couple of weeks ago. That was a, a film, a documentary called Atlantic, which is about the shell to sea issue over in Sligo. But there's lots of links. We are uh, funded as a reward-based crowdfunding platform, so we're similar to Kickstarter and Indiegogo, but there's many other types of crowdfunding platforms that are used. And in Ireland, the other two main uh, uh, crowdfunding websites, which are equity-based and loan-based, are CDIPS, which are based up in Derry. They have offices in London, New York, and uh, I think Toronto. And then Link Finance, which is a loan-based website. So if you don't know about them, there's kind of the three um, crowdfunding um, platforms that are Irish. Um, there are lots of great resources out there to get lots of sectoral uh, data. The crowdfunding industry report is the main one. It's published annually in January or February each year. And you get all of those juicy little details, like what's the median project across all, project, all platforms. And when you read that, you get an automatic reality check across all platforms that report into the crowdfunding industry report. The median value was $10,000 or lower. So, reality check. $10,000 or lower, if you want to be successful at crowdfunding and that's the median level, that is the first thing you should think about. Crowdfunding, in, to make it successful, be realistic. So, to give you an idea of consumer patterns on our website, lots of people always ask us, when's good times to talk to people or when's not? Yep. So we regularly release infographics about um, patterns on our site. Um, you can see um, in this case that 95% of pledges on our platform are below 150 euro. But the 5% that are above 150 euro are a large proportion of pledges. We have pledges that are in the 1,000 euro to 5,000 euro and above regularly on the site. And I'm hoping that the two speakers after me will talk to you a little bit about the importance of having a targeted approach to people that have higher amounts of capital to give to a campaign. In our case, 10% of pledges are anonymous and that you might never know who gave you the money. And 16% of pledges are made at weekends, which means 84% of all activity happens during the week. So if you're not on the ball during the week, you're missing out on the prime time for running a crowdfunding campaign. During the day, in our case, it's Irish time, so during the night it's pretty dead, and I'd say that's pretty consistent across all crowdfunding platforms. But in terms of peak activity, we definitely have points of interest between 9 and 11 o'clock during the day, and after work between 7 and 9 p.m. when people are watching TV or at home using their devices to go online and check out. So if you're running a campaign and you're thinking about when's the best time to do it, focus primarily during the week and at specific times when you know people are going to be at computers or looking at the internet. And that is 
if anyone works in a company, you know that you tend to drift off and go and look at the internet at about 11 o'clock and probably check your mobile on the way home and then when you sit down and watch TV, you might have your laptop out or your iPad and are surfing the net. So basics, be prepared. So research, number one, it's obvious. But if you are going to go to a platform, in our case, we moderate every single project that comes up. So if you don't present, a fully formed idea which is transparent, it has a budget, we can see the people behind it, we know exactly what their plan is in terms of their campaign, we send it back to them and say, you're not ready, you need to come back to us when you come back with a detailed budget about how you're going to deliver this to market and you're going to fulfill all your awards in a timely fashion. You need to tell us as much as you can about all the people behind this project because that's transparency, that's making people feel like they're investing in people. And then you've got to focus on all the other elements. If you're creating a consumer product, you have to have really good designs, really good imagery, and a good video, which puts your product or what you're trying to create in the best possible light at that particular point. So all of the platforms, you'll notice, are starting to move into image-based information. So they want to see what the end product is going to be like so that the people that are pledging money know what they're getting. In our case, because we focus primarily on the creative industries, we always talk about rewards being as creative as possible, and I don't think there's any reason why that can't transfer onto more business-orientated crowdfunding. Some of the most successful projects on our site are where musicians open themselves up to private concerts. They do a Skype gig into someone's living room, or they'll come and perform at a party in your house for your friends if everyone gives 100 euro and you get five mates to give 500 euro. You've got your favorite band to come to your party and celebrate your 30th or your 40th birthday. Simple things that are really creative, low cost, but high value for the people that are getting them. You can do that. Like, let your mind run is what I'm saying with rewards. The more creative they are and more unusual they are, the more your friends or people that know you are going to say, this guy is doing something crazy, let's give him the 500 euro and make sure that we get the value out of that reward. The next thing to do is to talk to other projects. So you've got the benefit of having two successful project creators here to pick their brains and go to the pub with. They have a wealth of knowledge about all of the things that didn't go right. And those things are the things you should be asking about. When did they realize halfway through their campaign that they were only 25% funded and how did they pull it out of the bag and get it up over the 100%? And I reckon they'll probably all say, it was hard work, it wasn't easy. We spent hours making sure that we were communicating with individuals in a personal way and we were using multi-channels to communicate what we were doing. Now, three years on, and as crowdfunding industry develops, people are all focused on reward delivery. And if you're going into a new campaign and you're not thinking about how you're going to get your rewards delivered in a timely fashion, you're not setting yourself up for the best possible results. Because ultimately, if you're successful with one and you deliver what you've said you're delivering, those people are more likely to come back and fund you in your, in your next crowdfunding campaign. Logical, it's customer service. So the more you can put customer service at the beginning of your campaign now, if you've never done one before, the more likely you are to get a second or a third crowdfunding campaign that could be double your initial target or triple your, your target. And then from the very first point of you thinking of doing a crowdfunding campaign all the way through to delivering and post-delivery, accept feedback. It's a really great way to, to hone your next campaign. It's a great way to hone your product if you're going to develop it and have multiple iterations of it. And I hope the next speakers are going to talk about how they're going to approach future crowdfunding campaigns or future investment campaigns and the learnings that they have from it, from crowdfunding. So, in terms of running a campaign, it is high intensity. Expect to work full time if you want to be successful. You will be spending the vast majority of your time either communicating by email individually or through mass media or mass email um, providers on social media, primarily Facebook, Twitter. LinkedIn is quite popular as well, but in terms of our own website, about 25% of all traffic originates from Facebook, 10% from Twitter, and uh, LinkedIn is about 2 or 3%. And then you cannot uh, underestimate the value of the traditional media and other online media in terms of lending weight to your crowdfunding campaign. The more you get 
um, journalists, bloggers, either domestic or international, to write about what you're doing or your product because you have researched them and you know that they're interested in the area that you're in, the more likely you are to be successful and you will gain international traction. You can, there is no reason why the Times or the New York Times wouldn't cover projects in Ireland or a journalist wouldn't cover them if it was an interest that they had. And there are plenty of examples on our website of people who have said, I'm not going to focus on the Irish media, I'm going to go and look to other countries to find out where the interest is in this particular activity that I'm doing. And one of your speakers is going to hopefully talk a little bit about that too. But remember, if you're going to talk to traditional media, be really targeted. Go with a specific reason. I know you're interested in this area and this is my product and this is why I think it's relevant to you and your readers. Be informative. Say exactly what it's going to do, how it's going to change or revolutionize what your industry is all about. And, as I said, don't just focus on national, go international, because if you get international, you're going to get those pledges. It happens. 25% of pledges I'm funded at this point are all from overseas, and our overseas pledges are higher than the domestic pledges. Um, managing communications with funders is the bit that people go, oh, so I've got my money, what do I do next? Do I have to kind of keep in contact with all these people? What do I, what should I do? And actually just putting simple processes in place to make sure that it's not overly onerous on you is the best advice I could give anyone. So if you're successful with your campaign, create a calendar of communications. It could be monthly, it could be bi-monthly, and just let people know my product is still in production phase. I don't expect it to have it until April 2015. So your ETA for delivery is May 2015. Once I've checked it and made sure it is okay. Divide your funders into manageable lists. So you'll have people that have pledged to you at five euro or 10 euro all the way up to a couple of thousand euro. And you do not treat all of those people the same way. If you have a new love interest who's just given you a thousand euro and it may not be the traditional love but it's someone who loves your product so much that they want to give you a thousand euro they deserve more attention than the person that's given you five euro so treat them accordingly divide high level rewards and people into a special category that you might even talk to on a weekly basis or maybe even more depending on how well you know them um, privacy is a massive thing. One of the biggest pieces of feedback we get from people who have funded projects is that they get communicated to en masse and everyone's email addresses are in the CC or the uh, CC field and they come back to us and go, that's just not on. Why don't people think about privacy? I don't want people knowing that I've spent a lot of money on your project. So always use your BCC field all the time if you're sending emails to more than one person. Um, if you've got large lists and if you do uh, have several thousand people funding your project, you are going to have to get much more sophisticated in how you communicate with people and start pushing yourself into the digital marketing sphere. How can you use all of the kind of MailChimps or similar entities to communicate with people effectively for you? Um, all of the crowdfunding platforms have activity updates, so that activity update is sent out to every single person that funded your project. So there's actually no reason why you can't repeat your communications on an activity update and make sure it gets delivered to people by just using the website regularly. And then if you are a company and you're raising as a company, it is really useful to have one point of contact that is a visible person within your company that is responsible for all communications with any funders. It comes back to customer service. If you want those people to buy the product and be your product or service ambassadors, if they know that there's someone there that they can ask a question, they're more likely to be that ambassador. And then maintain communications. It is all about communications. Running a crowdfunding campaign and delivering rewards and keeping people engaged is about communications. So um, I'm going to talk about a second campaign and I think there's probably people here that have done uh, campaigns and we get regularly asked about this. We have projects that have been five times, six times successful on our, on our site at this point. Just one example is a regular monthly poetry publication in Ireland called Poetry Bus Magazine. They're on their fifth publication at this stage with us and what they do is they essentially just pre-sell every single publication on the site. Really simple. They just go put up 
here's our next publication. This is our sales outlet. You can buy buy it here. And they raise modest amounts of money, but it's enough to pay for the print run and make sure that they get it enough out there and can put it into different uh, sales locations. So we always ask those people, say, what did you learn from your first or your second campaign and what would you do different next time around? And that is primarily coming back, the feedback that we get is about, well, it's about kind of re reward delivery. People just want them, the things straight away and we can't actually manage that process well enough. So if you are on top of that and you communicate with people, again, communications, um, and you tell people where you are with the project and when it's likely to get into their hands, then you're stopping that initial question. So people who go, I haven't got it. I gave you that money two months ago. Where is the poetry uh, magazine that you promised? Um, instead of having to communicate individually with 50 or 60 people or however many it is, if you've sent that email first, they know it. So regular communications. Have you delivered rewards? In our case, the feedback that we get from people who have been blown away by campaigns, I, I was not expecting that reward to be sent to me like that. So really simple things like uh, magazines or DVDs or uh, CDs or art publications that are all packaged or presented in an individual way that's low cost always stands out and people come back to us and are using social media regularly to take a picture and go, that was amazing. I just opened up my latest gift from Funded or Kickstarter or Indiegogo, whichever it may be, and that person paid special attention to what I got. And then um, the best thing you can do is if you're going to run a campaign again is start talking about it. Tell people, oh, we've done one already. Um, what do you think we should offer as rewards with our second campaign? We're going to do one around our new product and start that process a little bit earlier. Um, how can you make people get on board before you're actually live on the site and that can be a crowdsourcing project in itself. Rewards that they're interested in, what product should do, how, what you're thinking of producing, can they involve, be involved in some way. Okay. So there's loads of other things that are on this slide. So being, um, so if you go onto a website, you have lots of different content fields that you can use. Being always um, aware of how information is presented on all those websites can make your life so much easier. So simple things like how images are presented. Most of the images are in standard fields, so always crop your images so that they are the best possible presentation on a website. Use all of the links to any location where your project or you can be found because people want to find out more about the person they're giving that thousand euro to or that 500 euro to. So if they can find you on Twitter, on Facebook, LinkedIn or anywhere else, it lends credibility to what you're doing. And then you should be bought into the concept. Uh, lots of projects that go up and just say, I want you to fund me, fund me. It just feels like you're taking, taking, taking. So if you are prepared to put your money where your mouth is and put five euro or ten euro into another project, you've got this list of here's all of the things that I've supported. I think this is a really great means of people raising money in this climate. And that means that you're both good at the giving and good at the receiving and delivering as well. Okay, so images we've talked about. Um, main descriptions. On all websites, you've got to present the information. So it, it should follow a series of specific questions if you're thinking in fundraising. And it's no different to a grant application to a state uh, agency in Ireland or the sponsorship approach. It's just clarity and transparency. So what, it, what, what are the critical things? What is the project? Who is involved? What's their experience? Will they deliver this if they are experienced? And why are they using Fundit or Indiegogo or Kickstarter? Why is crowdfunding the right source of fundraising for this project? What's the budget for the project? How much do you need to crowdfund? And what will the money be spent on? And the last one, most important, is thanking people. The more you thank people, the more people are likely to go. They actually appreciate the fact that I've given 10, 15, 20 euro of my hard-earned cash into this project. I talked a little bit about rewards. On our website, the key price point is 50 euro. Your 50 euro reward should be absolutely cracking. If you, it's not, we're going to be the first people to tell you, you need to think more about how you can make that, that level a good level for you. 
And then if you've got a high crowdfunding target, if you're using any crowdfunding platform and you're looking for more than 25,000 euro, you better have some really clever, intelligent uh, rewards that are at the 500 to 1,000 to 5,000 level that people will be willing to spend money on. And you need to have done research before you go live to make sure you know who those people are that have 500 euro or 5,000 euro to give to your campaign. And last of all, budget for delivery. Make sure that if you're sending things out to people that you've included all of the packaging costs, all of the post costs, anything to do with getting something to someone. If you haven't put that into your budget, you are missing out on one of the biggest fall down areas. And that's simply to do with the weight of delivery. So if you have a heavy product that you didn't test how heavy it was going to be and you suddenly have to deliver it to 500 people, you are faced with a major budget shortfall in your campaign. Okay, so video preparation, I know someone else is going to talk to it, so I'm just going to say a couple of short things. Um, proven research says that people's attention it dips after 30 seconds, so if you don't communicate everything in the first 30, 30 seconds about your campaign that's critical, you're losing people's attention. So keep it short. Um, showcase your creativity. In our case, if it's musicians or filmmakers or things like that, you should show some of your other material that you um, have made so that people can judge or benchmark the type of output that you create. Explain why you're using funded or crowdfunding. Why, why are you using this one? I couldn't get a grant. Or I'm doing this as stage one in my fundraising exercise. I want people to help me get this off the ground. And if I get it off the ground, I'm going to go to a series of other funders that can help get this to a much bigger level. And then be yourself. There's nothing worse than a crowdfunding campaign that gets presented with no one behind it. If you have people behind it, people are more likely to give to people. And that's the number one rule in fundraising. If you have a person that people can talk to and say, I'm giving my money to that person, you are more likely to get funded. And if you present a company, which is often used, you're presenting a barrier to an individual. So if it is a company that you're fundraising for, make sure that the people in that company are heavily associated with the company name when you're on the crowdfunding website. So that's it. I think I probably have about a minute or two. If anyone has any questions while I'm here and would like to know, I have lots of... Yep? are ultimately honored. So um, across platforms, it's different. We use Relex. Sorry? Yes, of course. So the question was, um, what level of pledges are actually honored? So in online transactions, when we, if you have an all or nothing campaign, all the transactions go at the end point of your campaign. And at that point in time is only when a transaction is initiated. So you've got um, issues like uh, lost cards, decline cards because they're overdrawn. You've got issues to do with um, any technological interface with payments. And in our case, our, uh, our success rate is 98% of all pledges are honored. Um, in other platforms, I know it varies somewhere between 95 and about 98%. But we have a relatively high success rate. We have multiple points in time when people can honor their commitment. So if it fails first time, they get an email to say it didn't work. And then we proactively follow up with people to say your pledge didn't work. We can do it over the phone and make sure that we capture as much of it as possible. But all pl pl platforms have, and all kind of retail online elements have a degree of this doesn't work or this card didn't work. Okay. Yeah, so, well, so you're putting your IP out there to be consumed by people and to be um, picked apart and potentially replicated without you knowing. So yes, a degree of speediness is, is critical if you are and um, if you're putting your IP out in a public domain, you should be focused on raising as much money on, to get that to market as quickly as possible. And that's probably a common theme amongst all the consumer products that are on the, the bigger platforms. So, 
interested in that kind of product and interested in coming involved in that product. Yeah, well, probably a couple of examples of that. We have lots of people that become kind of brand ambassadors. So you, they may have brought something to a crowdfunding campaign and then their funders actually take on the, a lot of the sales activity of it. But then there's lots of investors that have found projects on our site and said, oh, I like that. I'd like to give money to it at this point in time or I may give it to money based on them actually raising this amount of money online. So you can use crowdfunding strategically. I know lots of people that have said, well, we've proven our audience and we've, proven, we've done the market research and we've commercialized our idea to a degree and they've gone on to other funders to say our market exists, we know exactly who they are, we've done some research based on this initial pilot and, and this is um, the money we need to get it to a bigger level. So yes is ultimately the answer to that. Okay. Is um, getting money for your product always the primary goal It's a much about, as much about awareness. If you can, if you can create a viral moment that gets you on a global path a, a, to a global level, you've got um, pretty much gold dust. That someone who has an idea, start a, a startup, whatever it may be, if they got that type of traction, yes. But then roll that back to being realistic and saying Kickstarter has a forty percent success rate, so sixty percent of projects don't get funded on the site. Yeah, there's, a, there's no major single player in Europe. Most countries have their own website. So Germany Start Next is a really good website. Um, there's Ulul, which is the French one. Um, and in the UK, I think there's probably about 20 different crowdfunding websites at this stage. Every, Pledge Music was the original one, which is a really successful music-based crowdfunding website. But they have um, uh, Unbound for books. Um, they've got Kickstarter now as well, which is flying in the UK and Northern Ireland. Um, and you, uh, Kickstarter is now in Netherlands and expected to roll out in multiple EU countries over the course of the next couple of years. So I guess there's lots of options out there. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, we're, uh, so funded as an entity exists within a parent company, so it's a it's a project of a of a fundraising and a kind of brokerage intermediary between the corporate sector and the art sector called Business to Arts. So it's a project that we operate. We knew that there was twenty million euro or twenty million dollars being invested in Kickstarter and Indiegogo to bring them to a global level. We think we've managed to create enough of a guaranteed Irish feel about Fund that we have a niche, we have a high success rate and we bring a certain type of fundraising knowledge to it. But there can be no doubt that we have been faced with competition from Kickstarter and Indiegogo since the time we launched it because there are hundreds of Irish projects that go to those platforms um, and yet we still have so when you look at the stats, Kickstarter pledges originating from Ireland are two point something million dollars, and we're up at three million euro of pledges. So we're holding our own at the moment is basically what I'm saying. Well, I think all of them are successful businesses in our case because people come with projects and they come with multiple projects and they may have uh, a CD and gigs um, that they're looking to crowdfund on our website, but they do it throughout the year. They're just taking one part of their business and crowdfunding on, uh, on our platform. But in terms of business enterprises, I don't know. So that's the kind of piece of research that I don't think it's been done on, the, on any of the crowdfunding platforms about if they got the traction, did it result in a sustainable and long-term long business venture for them? I don't know.